Good morning. Happy Monday. We'll see if we can go a day without snow. Not a day without sunshine, a day without snow. I'll call the, we'd like to call the meeting of the Senate Finance and Assembly Ways and Means uh, committees to order. And would the secretary please call the roll. Assemblywoman Anderson. Assemblywoman Backus. Assemblywoman Brown May. Assemblywoman Dickman. Assemblywoman Gorlow. Assemblywoman Hafen. Assemblywoman Howdegy. Assemblywoman Kasama. Assemblyman Miller. Assemblyman O'Neill. Assemblywoman Peters. Assemblyman Watts. Assemblyman Yeager. Senator Canizaro. Senator Goykachia. Senator Harris. Senator Neal. Senator Wynn. Senator Severs Gansert. Senator Titus. Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Chair Don Darrow Loop. Thank you very much, and please mark those present as they arrive. We have uh, members out doing bills this morning. So for those who are presenting today, please remember to state your name for the record, and uh, if you have a card, please leave it with the secretary. A reminder to all those in the audience to please um, silence your cell phones. We have two items on the agenda today. First, Amy Stevenson, Director of the Governor's Finance Office, will give a presentation regarding the Governor's recommendations for statewide inflation, enterprise information technology service rates, the Attorney General cost allocation, and other internal service fund rates, changes to fringe benefit rates, employee compensation, cost of living, and additional salary increases for certain employee classifications for the 23-25 biennium. Then we'll have uh, um, Sarah Kaufman and Wayne Thorley, our analysts, will provide a budget uh, work session and closing process. So Director Stevenson, would you please begin when you're ready and welcome, we're glad to see you here and thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Joint Committee. For the record, my name is Amy Stevenson, Director uh, of the Governor's Finance Office. This morning, I will be discussing statewide inflation, fringe benefit rate adjustments, and compensation initiatives. Um, the M100 statewide inflation decision units reflect the increases or decreases in revenue need included in the executive budget for each internal service fund. DHRM, or the Division of Human Resource Management, payroll assessment rates go from $85.02 in fiscal year 23 to $47.06 in fiscal year 24 and 25. The DHRM personnel assessment rates go from $260.50 in fiscal year 23 to $237.08 in fiscal year 24 and 25. Monthly fleet rental rates will remain unchanged from the previous biennium ranging from $187 to $346 relative to the class of vehicle rented. Property and content insurance rates go from 0 .00114 in fiscal year 23 to 0 .00192 in fiscal year 24 and 25. Employee bond rates go from $2.91 in fiscal year 23 to $3.79 in fiscal year 24 and 25. State-owned building rents, rent rates go from $1.10 per square foot in fiscal year 23 to 94 cents in 24 and 25. Purchasing assessment rates will decrease by 917,000 in fiscal year 24 and 25. The statewide cost allocation will increase by 369,000 in fiscal year 24 and decrease by 165,000 in fiscal year 25. The Attorney General cost allocation will decrease by $1.36 million in fiscal year 24 and $4.34 million in fiscal year 25. Tort claim insurance rates go from $85.29 per employee per year in fiscal year 23 to $116.41 in fiscal year 24 and $116.43 in fiscal year 25. <clears throat> Vehicle liability insurance rates go from 194.51 in fiscal year 23 to 342.42 in 24 and 342.91 in fiscal year 25. These adjustments reflect the costs that are in each of the cost pools associated with the various budget accounts. 
the M300 decision units are fringe benefit rate adjustment, accounts in the executive budget that have state positions included. M300 decision units adjust expenditures for the revised costs of the fringe benefits for these employees. <clears throat> these charges include both active and retiree group health insurance, unemployment insurance, and retirement rates. There's a decrease in the health insurance subsidy in the first year of the upcoming biennium. The active employee group insurance decreases from $755 in fiscal year 23 to 7306 in 24. It will then increase to 75860 in fiscal year 25. The retiree health insurance assessment is a percentage of gross salaries that funds a retiree health insurance subsidy. This amount will increase to 3.111% and 3.18% in fiscal year 24 and 25, respectively. <clears throat> the PEB budget anticipates pharmacy inflation at a rate of 3.67% in 24 in fiscal year 24 and 3.58% in fiscal year 25. These projections are congruent with medical inflation data provided by our analytics contractor, Moody's Analytics. Unemployment insurance contribution rates are decreasing due to a pro projected overage. As such, there will be no charges for the upcoming biennium. The actuarial, oops, yeah, the actuarial report for the Public Employee Retirement System, or PERS, as of June 30, 2022, increases contribution rates for employees. The current rate for employee, employer paid contributions is currently 15.5%. This will increase to 17.5% in 24 and in 25. The current rate for employer paid contributions is 29.75%. This will increase to 33.5% in, in fiscal year 24 and 25. The current rate for police and fire employee paid contributions is 22.75%. <clears throat> this will increase uh, to 25.75% in fiscal year 24 and 25. The current rate for police and fire paid contributions is 44%. This will increase to 50% in 24 and 25. <coughs> Workers' compensation is increased to 2.65% for 24 and 2.64% in 25 from the fiscal year 23 rate of 2.03%. This is calculated as a percent of gross salaries on a calendar year basis and remains capped at $36,000 per employee per year for the upcoming biennium. <clears throat> the Labor Relations Assessment funds the Labor Relations Unit within the Division of Human Resources Management, which was established under NRS 288.080. This fee is $48.96 per employee in fiscal year 24 and $67.55 per employee in fiscal year 25. Um, these are charged to the agencies on those PCNs eligible to participate in collective bargaining. <clears throat> Employee recruitment and retention has been a longstanding issue of this by a name for the state. The average statewide vacancy rate as of March 1st, 2023 is 21%, with the Department of Corrections being at 33% and the Department of Public Safety being at 29%. So this is why I don't do slides and I don't know why I tried to do it this time. There is a typo. There's a decimal point missing on my first one. It should say 48.6 million, not 486. So I just thought I would count that. <laughs> the executive budget, um, however, with, with that being said, that was our originally submitted number. Um, and then with some budget amendments, the, we're actually recommending 51.9 million uh, to provide one, two, or three grade increases to certain correctional officers and sworn law enforcement in order to address outstanding issues with pay parity. <clears throat> the executive budget also dedicates 579 million in general fund over the biennium to fund an increase in employees' salaries, retention incentives, and increased training opportunities to help improve retention and present state employment as attractive opportunity to state to, to job seekers. Um, this number will be adjusted as we are working with, um, with staff on updated retention incentive numbers. So this was originally cemented. So in this budget, um, 474 million address the COLAs and the rest are in separate uh, budget bills that are being heard. With that, this concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Just a clarification question. So there's a decimal point, 48.6 million, but there's not one in the recruitment and retention. That, that 
number stands. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amy Stevenson, for the record, yes, that is correct. Fine. I, I'm, I'm sure the director of DPS would be happy to have that other amount, but um, thank you very much. And, um, and if he's watching, you can't have it, so. Um, we'll start with uh, Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. This is what happens when you work on Saturdays on. Okay. I have two questions, if that's okay. My first is on your slide, page eight. Um, you said there's a budget amendment that will change that 48.6 million to 51.9 million for parity. Where were that put those officers? I'm glad, thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Roman Reno. So I actually have, and I can provide, sorry, Amy Stevenson for the record. This is why you have someone by your side too. Um, and I can actually provide this to staff, but I have a um, kind of a summary. So um, for those departments with sworn officers, which, which include uh, the Department of Public Safety, Corrections, Health and Human Services, DCNR, Motor Vehicles, NCHI, Wildlife, Gaming Control Board, Agriculture, Cannabis Compliance, AG's Office, and the Secretary of State. So it'll say the old grade and the new grade, if you would like me to submit that. That would be great, thank you. You're welcome. And then manager, my second question. Could um, we go to the highway fund, the salary adjustment? Could you tell us why general fund appropriations are, at, are to be utilized to support the proposed salary adjustments um, instead of the highway fund for those highway funded positions? Thank you, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Monroe Monreno. I'm not sure I understand the... Okay, so there are COLAs that are in the governor's recommended budget, and some of those positions are um, currently funded with highway funds, not general funds, but in the recommended budget, they would be funded with general funds, not highway funds for the COLAs. Why was that adjustment made? Thank you, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Monroe Monreno. For the record, my name is Amy Stevenson. Um, I do have the report that shows, so the 474 I mentioned is general fund, but we do have hi, um, highway fund adjustment as well. Um, and let me do some quick math on what that is. I'm sorry, I didn't total it. But there is an adjustment that I can send to you. Um, again, there's a, there's a report that came right, right out of NEB, so I will provide that, but there is a highway adjustment. Thank you. The reason I was asking, because historically, highway funded positions, if there's a COLA, that COLA is generally funded from highway funds, but in the recommended budget, that COLA would be funded from general funds, not highway funds. We were wondering why the change. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Monroe Monreno. Um, I believe with those highway fund, for the record, my name is Amy Stevenson. So he did, it says name on here. And just <laughs> say name. <laughs> That's my name, name, sorry. Um, so those funded with highway funds would, that COLA would be used, it is our intent for the, those to be highway funds. So it's general fund and highway fund and I will get you and staff that number. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe we have a question from Assemblywoman Bacchus. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my questions are gonna to pertain to the E673 and E674 salary adjustments, kind of follow up to um, Chair Monroe Monreno's question, but um, specifically with those 50 budget adjustments that were made, what factors were considered in recommending the additional salary grade increases included in, the, in those positions? And it may be the pay period, but is there anything a little more that you have to add for that? Thank you, uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Bacchus, Amy Stevenson, for the record. Um, it was strictly pay parity. So we um, looked at all the positions throughout the whole state to include all the other, um, and we wanted to make sure there wasn't a compaction issue. So the decisions that we made, originally, um, we realized that there was a compaction issue and that's why the budget amendments. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'll just follow up on that. Is with, is there any, were there any studies or analysis conducted um, to determine that salary grade increase for those various positions as appropriate? 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Amy Stevenson. Um, there's an internal study. I, I, we didn't pay an outside person, but um, we did do a study um, and compared both unclassified and classified positions and then um, determined we, we at least tried to keep a 5% um, pay parity between a supervisor and the, those that they supervised. Thank you. And I believe uh, Senator Neal has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so according to my notes, and I guess I I'm, I'm need to understand this. So retention, are the retention dollars separate from the salary grade increase? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So there are some positions such as um, like the law enforcement training specialist, they're at 0% vacancy rate. Um, AG cybercrime is at 0%. Uh, vacancy rate, um, supervisor criminal investigators at 0% vacancy rate. There are a series of 0% vacancy rates. So it looks like from the, from the notes or from this data, they don't have trouble retaining anyone because they don't have any vacancies. So why, why are they getting retentions as well? Um, thank you to you, Madam Chair, to Senator Neal. Um, the the two grade increase wasn't um, isn't a retention incentive. Um, it's strictly a pay parity. So they are equivalent to other law enforcement series in other um, departments, and we wanted to make sure that they were equal across the board. That be, because then you have other agencies stealing. Or for instance, if we used an AG position and it's the same in DPS and DPS pays more, then we're going to rob all of AG's sworn officers to go over to DPS and then you wouldn't have any. So this uh, grade was just to address pay parity. Did that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. So I have a follow up and it's more like a general question. So on the slide eight, we're talking about employment, employee recruitment and retention for 579 million. And so all, although I know we need to recruit and we need to um, retain in certain places, I guess, you know, when you, when you look at, like, how much we're spending, um, this is probably one of the ones where we might we need to probably take some kind of hit there. But when you look at everything else, it's what it costs. It's almost, I mean, this is just my opinion. I feel like we've already made it to you know, spending the extra two billion. And I'm trying to figure out in like when we come to twenty six and twenty seven, are we going to be able to sustain that five seventy nine or is this a is this a one time you get a you get a raise now and not later? Thank you through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Neal, uh, Amy Stevenson, for the record. So out of that $579 million, um, 474 of that is the COLA, or ongoing costs. Um, and then the rest, the remaining of that is one-time costs, and that's the re uh, retention incentives. And then there's some a little bit of money in there for professional development training. So the 474 is ongoing costs, and, and we have determined that that can be sustained. Did that answer your question? Thank you for that. So, Madam Chair, just really quick. So you determine it could be sustained by, do you guys have a, because I haven't seen the economic forum, but you, you that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Is there a rumor out there that, you know, because we're not raising revenue, so what, what, how are you sustaining it? Thank you through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Neal, Amy Stevenson for the record. Um, based off of the current economic forum, if things were not to change, um, we could sustain, and then there is a cushion. So if something were to happen, we um, we do have that amount to sustain the 474. I can send that to you if you would like. Yeah, I would, because I thought that, you know, some of the factors that were coming forward in the, you know, forum is that we're going to normalize, right? This, the, you know, COVID spending spree is going to normalize. And so we're going to see some normal revenues come in. And I think it would probably be wise to know what that is, um, um, mainly because you're not, and I, and I say this in all respect to employees, so don't take what I'm saying as Senator Hill doesn't want to give us any money, because that's not true. Um, but I feel like, you know, 
this is just one side of the coin of the dollars going out of the building, right? And from one side, right? And so I just wanted to put that on the record. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Wynn, please go ahead. Thank you. This is kind of following up on um, the chair's question earlier about those what kind of studies or analysis was done on those salary grade increases? And I know you said you had just kind of looked at them and you wanted to make sure there was like that 5% differentiating between like managerial or I guess and subordinate. Um, what kind of determination and what kind of analysis went into just over across the board? Is 5% like typical between the range of those, like how is the determination of the step increases just generally? Um, I obviously there wasn't a commission, a study commissioned, as you said earlier. Um, were we just eyeballing them? Were we kind of looking across the board? If you could just give a little bit more detail on that, that process. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair, to uh, Senator Wynn. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Amy Stevenson, for the record, 5%, um, if you were to look at it, it's usually, so um, in the classified series, an AA3 could supervise an AA2, and that is generally a, about a 5% um, difference between, between those two salaries. So in general, to answer your question, yes, 5% is like the, the standard, the least amount that, or not the least, the most amount, because we can't get to 10% parity right now, so we went with the, with the 5% and looking at all the, the difference between the supervisors between, between their subordinates. Chair, may I follow up? So is 10% the standard when we were only able to get to five? Oh, I'm phone, phone a, a friend, friend is coming. Phone a friend. <laughs> Good morning, thank you. Uh, for the record, I'm the friend, uh, Mandy Bosmith, Administrator for the Division of Human Resource Management. Um, to answer your question, in the classified service, generally speaking, in local government and in state government, the grades that separate each, so we, we start uh, at, a, at, say, a grade 20 and go to a grade 55 in the classified service, typically those grades are separated by 5%. So a grade 20 would be 5% lower than a grade 21 in the base salary. Usually, in the classified service, you have a 5% margin between your subordinate employee and your supervisory employee. Now, depending on what kinds of employees those are and what kinds of supervisors they are, you can get as much as a 15% differential, again, depending on what kinds of employees they are. And then just the determination of the initial salary grade increases, um, how were those determined? Were they, I know you had mentioned you wanted to be competitive with other, was it just competitive within like, you gave the example of DPS and um, the AG's office and people wanting parity between those positions. Is there parity just within the state agencies and similar positions or is there parity, do these um, increases also have parity with, I guess, like outside agencies that are also poaching state workers in the law enforcement area? For the record, Mandy Bosmith, Administrator for the Division of Human Resource Management, uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Nguyen. What this one, two, and three grade increase in the governor's recommended budget represents is more pay parity among the officers within the state. So as an example, category two peace officers, which make up your AG criminal investigators, your compliance enforcement investigators in DMV, um, transportation authority, taxi cab authority, youth parole, those, there had been quite a, um, uh, quite a, variation between how those 
job classifications were graded. Um, you will see in some of the backup documentation that, for example, one particular job classification received a three grade increase, not because they were more special than anybody else, but because they were actually behind more than others. Then in terms of the category one peace officers, um, this is an effort, the two grade increase for category ones is an effort to try to get more along the line of base pay parity with local law enforcement agencies. If you look at state of Nevada, so for example, DPS officer one and two, uh, if you look at game warden one and two, our entry level base pay is right in line with RPD and Washoe County and Metro. Where we differ significantly is in those bargained for uh, extras, the premium pays that are bargained for. And then category threes, um, unfortunately, I think we can all agree that corrections is really a hard job um, and it's a very difficult job to do, and we are trying to get parity with other states in what they pay correctional officers. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll go to Assemblyman Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I guess one question I have, so you, you mentioned some of the other decision units that affect take-home pay, right? So we've got... Um, increase in uh, the PERS contributions. Uh, we have changes in the, the benefit program. So do you have both for the law enforcement positions that are getting the various step increases as well as for state employees generally, what's the actual take home pay bumps that state employees are gonna see once you factor in COLAs, bumps for those are, who are getting them, and then also factor in the PERS contribution and benefits that are gonna eat up some of that. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblyman Watts, Amy Stevenson, for the record, I don't have the actual what is a take home, but I can get that for you. Thank you very much, and um, if it's okay, may I have a follow up, Madam Chair? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I, I would also be interested in understanding what the what the real take home pay is because our state employees have been through a lot and obviously the cost of living adjustment tends to be inflation based. We've all felt the the impact of that and um, obviously we've been in a bit of a fiscal roller coaster with uh, over the last few years and so it'd be useful to kind of have a little bit of a look back period and understand both with the cuts that have had to be made um, and the restorations and inflation, where, where are state employees going to be at relative to five to 10 years ago when you factor in what, all the different, um, any pay bumps, anything that's eaten into that, and then inflation that's eaten into that and, um, and where they stand. I think that would be, that would be helpful, especially as we, you know, look at, and again, I appreciate um, all of the initiatives that are in here. My personal opinion is that, you know, I'm, I'm still concerned about how this positions us for recruitment and retention when in general, a lot of what I've seen when we've gotten into some of the details is that uh, law enforcement or non-law enforcement, um, when we're looking at these significant vacancy rates and we look at just competing with local government, um, we tend to look at being 30% behind in take home pay or more. Um, so uh, if you could get some of that information, I think that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will go to Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for being here today. Uh, my question is kind of along the same lines, and I, I'm definitely going to be using the the fiscal roller coaster phrase a lot from here on out because it's a great phrase. Thank you for, for putting that in the room. Um, is this, does the compensation initiatives also include our secretaries that work for the paralegals and um, legal secretaries that work for the attorney general's office? Because I know sometimes they are considered in this area. And if so, um, how much would that pay rate in, increase be? And is it, uh, or how much is that pay increase? And then also, can that, again, be sustainable? 
Thank you through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Anderson, uh, Amy Stevenson for the record. So are you asking, and I just wanna make sure that I have the right, are you asking about the, the two position grade? Does the legal secretaries in that one or? It has to do with all the legal secretaries uh, because from the sounds of it, they have, they are severely underpaid. And I didn't know if that was part of this or if that's in a different budget. So to answer your question, thank you for clarifying, is um, they are not included in the two, the two grade, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It is Monday. <laughs> in the two grade um, decision unit. Uh, but they are in the, the COLA. They are considered, everybody, all state employees are included in the COLA um, proposal. That's the word I was looking for, proposal. Follow up? Go ahead. Thank you. So if they were to be included, do you know how much that would be? And uh, if that would be in this budget or in a different one? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Anderson, Amy Stevenson, for the record, I will find that out. I don't have that, um, and I will get back to you on that. Thank you very much. And I believe Senator Neal had another follow-up question. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and this is a follow-up to where um, Assemblyman Watts was going. So in my uh, notes, it was it looks like in the PERS contribution um, for police and fire, and this is employer-paid retirement police and fire, um, that there would be a reduction in salary by like 18 percent roughly and then an employer paid retirement just regular there would be a reduction in salary by like 12.9 percent and so when assemblyman watts was talking it just i was bringing back to memory like all the meetings that we've had and folks coming to the table saying i appreciate the raise but at the end of the day, my PERS contribution is going to eat up the salary that I'm going to actually take home, right? We heard that from the uh, school districts on Saturday. They were saying, yay, but, right? And so have, has, has the governor's office actually considered, you know, you want to do this raise, but how do you limit, um, I guess, the burden on the reduction, right, that's coming from the PER side. Because at the end of the day, right, if we leave the building and it's like, well, I appreciate the raise, but actually my check was smaller, right, um, then they don't actually feel that raise. And 18% and 12% is actually a lot that's going to be eliminated. And so I'm wondering, are you having that conversation, right? For the record, Mandy Bo Smith, Administrator for the Division of Human Resource Management, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Neal. Um, again, I'm the friend we're phoning. Um, we so in 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 the Division of Human Resource Management, we have done a lot of seeking to understand PERS contributions, how they affect employees in terms of state employment versus local government employment or uh, school district employment. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and, and I know that Executive Director Liss is here and can answer this probably better than I can, but what we have learned is state employees are in a very unique situation where we are um, either paying uh, the contribution in full or the employee is paying part of the contribution, but in both cases, the contribution is still being in some way paid by the employee. That is true also at the local government level. I know it doesn't look like it because local governments inflate their salaries uh, such that it absorbs the employee contribution for PERS. So for example, at, um, at a local municipality, a, um, a salary may be quoted at $80,000 a year um, but that includes whatever the fringe benefit piece would be for the employee contribution for PERS, whereas a similarly situated employee may be paid more along the lines of, say, $50,000 at the state of Nevada, not because they do different jobs, but because there is that PERS impact. When the way that PERS works, and I'm sure uh, that Director Liss has sat, sat in front of the money committees and explained in terms of the actuarial piece, um, the way that this works is there is a serious actuarial research done on 
the, you know, what the fund takes in, what the fund pays out, and then how they have to support going forward. And in terms of keeping the fund solvent, that this is how we end up with contribution increases. With respect to how it's passed on to employees, this has been considered in many different areas. So as an example, we have considered it in DHRM with respect to collective bargaining in trying to figure out a way, if there was a way, to offset that. There is not a way um, without significant change in the way that PERS operates and significant change in NRS 286, um, and I'm sure Director Liss will, will come up here and correct me if I've got this wrong, um, the, without significant change in how the fund operates and without significant change in NR, NRS 286, we cannot affect the kind of change that I know that constituents are asking you to bring forward to the state. We, we just cannot do it. Um, and anything short of having the ability in terms of our funding mechanisms, our revenue streams, and being able to sustain it going forward, anything short of raising base pay by the contribution amount, there will always be an offset um, in the way this is. So yes, there is an offset for those cost of living increases and for the two grade increase that some law enforcement officers are receiving because of the purse contribution. But that is not something that can be fixed by this governor's office in, in the recommended budget. Okay, thank you for that, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, and we'll go to Assemblywoman Brown May. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. It's great to see you here today. Uh, my question is really more relative to the uh, compensation analysis. You talked a little bit about how you did an internal assessment relative to some of those pay increases, but my question is more relative to statewide. As we were looking to make in incremental changes and, and increases to specific positions, and I know that we have a consultant that we have been working with or hired by human resource management. So is that part of the plan to do a compensation analysis and study for all of our positions across the board so that we understand where we are competitively? And can you talk to that for just a minute? For the record, Mandy Bowsmith, Administrator in the Division of Human Resource Management. Thank you for the question. Through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Brown May. It is absolutely the DHRM's, um, one of our two biggest priorities in the upcoming biennium, to do a comprehensive compensation study. It is also one of our big priorities to do a comprehensive classification study. Um, so just to give you, uh, some of you uh, who are long serving in the legislative body will know that um, in years past, the DHRM has conducted what are called occupational group studies. And that is taking um, the occupational groups that are listed on the DHRM's classification website um, and doing uh, occupational group studies. As an example, uh, administrative clerical is an op occupational group. Uh, sworn law enforcement is a is a occupational group, so we would do periodic occupational studies. The problem is right this minute is that in 2007, um, those occupational studies slowed, and then by 2009 they were they were halted completely. And part of the reason is because we were in a significant recession in the state, we could not fund any potential. Uh, compensation increases that would have come as a result of those compensation studies. And we were essentially halted in doing those things. And so from 2009 forward, any compensation study that has been done has really not been given serious consideration in terms of the gap and the widening gap for state employees. What we are hoping to accomplish in this biennium is with a third party consultant giving you, the legislative body, the information that you need to make the decisions for how we lessen the gap between state employees and their similarly situated counterparts in local government and in private sector. And we are, um, and, and it is true, you have heard it in budget presentations. Um, you have heard it from me in my own budget presentation. You've heard it from Director Stevenson. The state of Nevada, on the whole, is anywhere between 30% and 75% behind our similarly situated counterparts. And there are a lot of factors that go into that, but we, that gap is just widening. 
And the longer that, that we as a state take to address these issues, the wider that gap will get and the more difficult it will be for us to catch up. And so the, the two grade increases for law enforcement or three grade increases are really meant to try to, it's a baby step to, to help uh, narrow the gap that we currently face. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and there are literally thousands of positions within the state of Nevada. How many, do you have an idea how many comp class studies would be required and are, we, are you going to be able to do this in the biennium to present information that we can then act on? For the record, Mandy Bosmith, Administrator for the Division of Human Resource Management, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Brown May. There are 1,181 job classifications currently active for the state of Nevada. We have 25-ish thousand uh, allocated FTEs within those job classifications. That includes uh, the Nevada System of Higher Education. Our goal is to get through a comprehensive classification study of all of them. And, and it's not just about compensation, it's about some of our job classifications haven't been reviewed in a very long time. So for example, uh, in the Division of Human Resource Management, we are still calling folks personnel officers and personnel analysts and personnel technicians. And um, well, it's antiquated. We need to change things and make it, I don't know, human resources analyst or even now we're talking about people operations partners, things like that. I don't know that we'll go that far, but um, we, we need to take a look at a lot of our job specs. But to remove barriers to entry, uh, Senator Neal asked questions when we were doing our budget presentation about what we were really looking for. What we're really looking for is what is a barrier to entry for people getting into state employment? What, what is there that shouldn't be there? So as an example, we all know that with the internet, people are getting educations in different ways. People aren't necessarily having sheepskins hung up on their, on their walls because that's not how people are getting educated these days. Um, we don't necessarily need to require a four-year degree. We don't necessarily need to require an associate's degree. We don't necessarily need to require anything but a specified certification, depending on the kind of job it is. Those things make it very difficult for us to get folks in entry-level positions. And so comprehensively, those are what we need to look at. Can we do it in the biennium? Absolutely. Will we have something for you in 25 to present that is um, some in-depth analysis of what we need to do? Absolutely. Will we have started to do that before we bring it to you? Yes, because in terms of changing job classifications, the Personnel Commission is where the DHRM goes to, make sh to, to change job classifications, to change titles, to change minimum qualifications. But in terms of compensation, you will see me and perhaps direct, well, maybe us. Um, you might see us, you might see other people <laughs> in 25. Um, I don't want to be presumptive. Um, <laughs> coming back before you uh, doing, pleading for this same thing again, that we, we need money to fund state employees and state employment. And really, the, the key to our recruitment and retention lies in the money we can appropriate for state employee wages. Thank you very much. I feel like we've made a big circle, meaning that our forefathers, right, didn't necessarily have degrees and then we went to having degrees and now we're going back to that again. Um, additional questions from the committee. All right, well, I think that's it for now. We all know where you work and we all know where your friend works. We all know where your tech guy works. <laughs> and Director Tagliati, it is still 48.6. Um, all right, we have, we will now have a presentation from Sarah Kaufman, our Assembly Fiscal Analyst, and Wayne Thorley, our Senate Fiscal Analyst, on the budget work session process, as well as the budget subcommittee and joint full committee closing process. So um, when you're ready, um, please go ahead.
All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Wayne Thorley. I'm the Senate Fiscal Analyst with the Fiscal Analysis Division of the Legislative Council Bureau. And as the chair mentioned, Ms. Kaufman and I will be uh, going over um, kind of the, the process that the money committees will shortly be transitioning to. So we're approaching the midpoint of the 82nd legislative session, uh, which means the money committees are about to transition from reviewing uh, budgets into the work session and budget closing. Uh, portion of the legislative session. Uh, just to kind of give a quick update on the committee's progress to date. So there are 476 funded budget accounts in the executive budget. And uh, 258 of those were, were assigned uh, to the money committees for review. The remaining ones are, are what we call staff closed budgets, which we'll talk about in just a sec. Of the uh, 258 budgets that were assigned for review in either subcommittee or, or full committee, 247 of those have, have uh, you've heard, uh, and the remaining 11 are scheduled for budget hearings this week. Um, and then after that, after the end of this week, uh, we will be moving on to the budget closing process. Uh, we'll also be getting to the budget work session process, and that actually starts this week. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly go over uh, the work session process because it's a little different than the policy committees. And then Ms. Kaufman will go over the budget closing process. Um, so for budget accounts uh, that are larger and uh, more complex and for which there might be various options in addition to the recommendations in the executive budget, um, or for which uh, there's not time to adequately review the budget in, in a single hearing. Uh, those budget accounts are recommend, uh, are with discussion, in discussion with the chairs and the money committees are, are recommended for, for what we call a budget work session. Um, the work sessions really focus on these issues that require additional discussion um, and they help prepare you all so that when uh, it gets time to close the budgets, that you all uh, are, have all the information that you need to make an informed decision uh, on closing the budgets. Uh, they're also helpful for staff to the, the budget work sessions uh, because it allows you all to give us direction on what you want to see presented to you uh, in the budget closing uh, document. Uh, again, that's at, at the time that you all are ready to make decisions on, on how to fund the budget. Um, the work sessions, though, are, are a little different, as I mentioned previously, from the, poli budget, the policy committee work sessions where you, you are actually discussing a bill and then taking an action on the bill. Um, the, the budget work session is more for, there's, there's no official action by the, by the committees during a budget work session. It's more for, for you all to give us direction as staff to know what to bring back to you, you all when, when we present the closing documents. Um, in working with the money committee chairs, uh, we have identified uh, several budgets that will have a work session coming up, and a, a few of those are, are this week. Um, so coming up this week uh, on Thursday, uh, there's the state employee compensation and benefits uh, work session. So we will continue the discussion that you all just had uh, this earlier this morning um, and be presenting uh, options for you all to consider. Uh, also this week on Friday is the K-12 education funding uh, work session. Uh, at that meeting, uh, you all will be presented with various decision points that you all will need to make related to funding for K-12 education, the Pupil Center Funding Plan, and uh, state special education funding. Uh, so, so we'll go through those, uh, all those various options with you on Friday. Uh, we also have uh, tentatively scheduled, uh, and I say tentative just because the agendas uh, aren't, aren't published yet, and of course things are subject to change during session, um, a, a work session on the COVID-19 relief programs, uh, Department of Corrections, uh, the Judicial Branch, and the uh, Capital Improvement Program all coming up uh, in April. And Madam Chair, that's the end of my presentation. I don't know if you'd like Ms. Kaufman to go and then we'd be available to answer questions.
I think that would be helpful. Go ahead, please, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Sarah Kaufman, Legislative Council Bureau, Fiscal Analysis Division. I will be walking the committees through the budget closing process. Uh, the closing process is uh, slightly different for the various budget accounts in the executive branch uh, or ex the executive budget. Certain budgets are heard in full committee, uh, some are heard in subcommittee, and then some are also what we consider staff closings. Uh, the staff closed list uh, was provided to you all at the very beginning of session. Uh, the list contained recommendations for all of the budgets identified for staff closing and the budgets uh, recommended for hearing. Uh, as Mr. Thorley indicated, we are nearly done with the hearing of the budgets that have been identified as needing a hearing and will be moving into the closing process uh, this coming week. Uh, so in terms of the closing process, uh, accounts that are assigned to the full committee are closed also in full committee. Budget accounts assigned to staff uh, have closing recommendations that are developed by staff. And then those budget accounts that are assigned to staff, uh, they don't contain recommendations that require any significant policy uh, changes or uh, significant funding decisions uh, to be made, but they do include what we call technical adjustments. Uh, so what are technical adjustments? Those are adjustments that uh, staff is given authority to make um, in terms of adjustments to uh, maybe specific quantities of certain things, the prices of certain things, as well as adjustments to cost allocations. There may be um, some corrections that are made to budgets that don't necessarily involve uh, policy decisions or significant funding decisions. Uh, staff will be seeking authority for the subcommittees um, or from the subcommittees to make those technical adjustments once uh, the amounts uh, for those particular budget accounts uh, for those agencies are finalized. And uh, this authority usually uh, allows staff to make those final adjustments uh, so that the agency specific cost allocations can be adjusted, adjusted at the end of the closing process. Um, as Mr. Thorley indicated, the process for closing in full committee will begin April 4th, and in subcommittee it will begin uh, April 5th. Staff develops uh, closing sheets uh, for you all, and those are then presented to the joint uh, subcommittee members. The subcommittee actions are considered in one motion. However, uh, the Senate Committee on Finance, as well as the Assembly Committee on Ways and Means, uh, may make different decisions, and those are what we call uh, closing differences. Those will be then resolved at full committee. The uh, subcommittee actions are considered uh, to be recommendations to the full committee, so these aren't finalized decisions. Uh, those are then uh, brought forth to the full committee. Uh, subcommittees may also um, request to issue letters of intent, and letters of intent are requests that um, an agency report back to the Interim Finance Committee on their progress of executing uh, the funding recommendations approved by the money committees. On occasion, uh, the money committees will also uh, provide a letter of intent to um, have an agency or to uh, identify the um, intent of how a specific funding um, decision is, is to be ex executed. And letters of intent um, recommended by the subcommittee um, are recommended to the full committee and the full committee ultimately makes the, the decision uh, to, to issue those letters of intent. Once the subcommittee finalizes its closing recommendations uh, for particular agencies, those actions are reported uh, by staff to the full joint committees and acted upon by the full committees. And once the money committees act um, on the closing recommendations for all state agencies and resolve any differences, the uh, staff then records those actions and they begin uh, drafting what is considered the six major uh, money bills, which are the Appropriations Act, the Authorizations Act, the Education Funding Bill, the Pay Bill, the Capital Improvements Project Bill, and then the PEB Bill as well. 
That um, concludes my presentation on the closing process. We do have uh, one more issue to address with the committee, and uh, that is to um, seek blanket authority uh, to make technical adjustments on the statewide rates as well as the fringe benefits. Um, but I'll uh, hold off on that and uh, see if there's any questions that we might be able to answer at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, committee, any questions? Uh, Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you. So just, uh, and thank you for clarifying how the process is done. So we close a, we close a budget in April and then we get the economic forum in May. Are those budgets then completely away from the economic forum or is it then also, can those budgets be reopened to reflect the possibility of um, projected more money? For the record, Sarah Coffin, Legislative Council, Bureau of Fiscal Analysis Division. Uh, we typically don't reopen um, the, the budgets uh, after the economic forum. What will happen is um, we try to schedule all the significant uh, general fund agencies after the economic forum. So the, the ones that have a significant impact include uh, Nevada System of Higher Education, K-12, Department of Corrections. All of those have significant general fund. Um, the uh, legislature can also do what we've called uh, trailer bills. So, uh, for example, last session, uh, the Economic Forum um, had very conservative um, uh, projections during their December uh, meeting, and then when May uh, came around, they also um, their their projections were significantly higher. And so, what ended up happening was uh, there were some trailer bills that uh, uh, were were drafted and that um, put more funding into some of the areas that the legislators um, wanted to originally but just didn't have the funds to do so. Um, so that's uh, typically how uh, that would be addressed. Additional questions? Uh, Senator Titus. Uh, thank you both for the, for the presentation. Having done this multiple times now, um, I'm wondering if your trailer bills aren't similar to what, what Assemblywoman uh, Carlton would say, parking lot bills. Because what she would do sometimes, we would, um, many times, we would look at something we want to support, but then they're put, put in a parking lot she would use until we could fund them or not. So do we do some of that also? Thank you. Madam Chair, through you to Senator Titus. Uh, so the, the parking lot bills uh, were a, a variety of different bills. A lot of them had to do with like the one-shot appropriations and the supplementals. Uh, what typically happens is the money committees will hear a bill in one house and they can send it over to the other house, but the other house has to sit on it until the K-12 funding bill is passed. And once the K-12 funding bill is passed, and that meets the constitutional provisions, and then all of those other bills can be passed as well. Um, when that occurs, uh, Mr. Thorley and I will be um, keeping very uh, diligent track of the, the fund balance. And so we will update that almost on a daily basis to determine where, uh, where the funding is currently at to make sure that uh, the funds aren't being overspent. And so um, those are, are typically what we would consider the parking lot bills. Great, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much for your information. So Madam Chair, we do have one action for the committee to consider, if that's thank okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Sarah Kaufman, Legislative Council, Bureau of Fiscal Analysis Division. Uh, certain items pertain to global closing issues will uh, not be decided until later into the closing process. And so I will read the following request verbatim and ask that the committee take action on it. In each of the budget accounts throughout state government, there are decisions that cannot be uh, closed until, excuse me, there are decision units that cannot be closed until money committee close certain budget accounts that um, allocate costs. This includes decision unit M100, statewide inflation, that changes various rates paid to internal service agencies, such as the uh, attorney general, 
the Division of Fleet Services, the Enterprise Information Technology Services Division, the State Public Works Division, the Division of Human Resource Management, Vehicle Insurance, Purchasing Assessments, Property and Content Insurance, Employee Bond, and Statewide Cost Allocations. Generally, these issues will be decided upon once the money committees close certain budget accounts that allocate these costs. An additional global decision unit that is impacted on in this way is decision unit M300, which makes changes to various fringe benefit rates to state employees, including the public employees retirement system contribution rates, the public employees benefits program employer contribution rates. Therefore, fiscal staff requests the money committees grant staff the authority to make technical adjustments to these line items in the budget accounts as they are closed. Staff generally requests the same authority to make adjustments to the payroll and personnel assessments, the Enterprise Information Technology Services Division allocations, purchasing assessments, attorney general allocations, building rent, vehicle insurance, property content insurance, and the statewide cost allocation once they are finalized. Thank you very much. And do I have a motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to authorize fiscal staff to make the technical adjustments as just stated um, by staff for budget closing. Do I have a second? Motion by Assemblywoman Monroe Marino, the second by Senator Canazaro. Do we have any discussion? Senator Titus. Thank you. Just for clarification, we will be notified of those numbers correct at some point. I mean, you won't just make the adjustments without them being brought forward to us to let us know the adjustments. Madam Chair, through you to uh, Senator Titus. So those uh, are typically made after the budgets are closed. Uh, we, we have what's called balancing weekend. And so uh, as soon as we uh, understand what is involved with uh, some of those internal uh, agencies, those rates then are, are redistributed to uh, those agencies and that is then rolled into what we consider the major money bills. So it will be provided for in those um, those specific bills. Thank you very much. Not seeing any other discussion. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much for your time today and throughout the session. All right, with that, we will now move to our last item on the agenda, that is public comment. Um, if you are calling in, please dial 888-475-4499. And when prompted for the meeting ID, it is 814-5080-5938, press pound. And then we're prompted for the participant idea, please press pound. We'll start here in Carson City. And is there anyone for public comment? Seeing none, I don't see anyone down in Las Vegas. So we will go to the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. The public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. Committee members, this completes our business for today. I hope you all have a productive day. Thank you.